Welcome to Don't Say Adulting, a podcast by Grotto Network, hosted by Jane O'Connor and Mike Rossetti. It's the show where I ask the questions that I want to know. And also, I'm here too. I've never been such a millennial as this moment on a podcast drinking a pour over with some <laughs> milk. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Don't Say Adulting. Uh, I'm Jane O'Connor, and I don't know if you can already sense the absence, (laughs) but we are not joined by Mike Rossetti today. He wasn't able to make it, which is tragic, because I think he would have been a good addition to this topic, um, which is making friends as an adult, finding community. How do you do it? How does it work? Um, And so instead, I've brought in a good pal of mine, you know, I, it, <laughs> sorry, I'm not, I'm not letting you talk yet, but I've brought in Evan Gage. Um, That's me. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for joining. Um, and the reason is this was a tough one to find an expert for because how do you find an expert in friend making? Hmm. You know, there are social psychologists, there are regular psychologists, <laughs> <laughs> community organizers, which is probably closer to what Mike's role is, mm-hmm. but when I was doing all this research, I realized that you could distill a lot of these, this information on um, making friends as an adult into just a few pointers, hmm. things that I found we've talked about hmm. a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, I think you actually do have some expertise to share because one of the ways that I first knew about you was through these Friday night dinners. Yeah. We've actually, through Grotto, released a short piece on these Friday night dinners. And I just found out today you've been doing them for 10 years. For 10 years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We started in 2013. And they've spawned a few others yeah. in other cities. Yes, we've had a, I've hosted a, a dinner basically every Friday night um, since 2013. And then the people who have come have enjoyed them. So there's one now in Boston... There's one in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, there's one in D.C. And there's, yeah, I'd DC. heard about the one in D.C. too, the Thursday night dinner. The th- yeah, the th- <laughs> the, it's very progressive. You know, the Thursday <laughs> night dinner for the working adult. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was like, well, there's actually some, there's some credentials there. Yeah. And I found you to be a bit of a social facilitator in my own life, I think in other people's lives. Um, and I thought this could just be the chance to kind of converse. This will be a bit of an unusual Don't Say Adulting episode. Um, we're missing Mike. Um, and so I thought we could just engage in a bit of conversation, address some of these, this information totally. that we found. Yeah. Um, and I guess we'll start by mentioning how this topic came about. I think it's one that a lot of, uh, recent college grads face. Totally. When, totally. Yeah, yeah. When they move out of the college environment. And we've mentioned this in several episodes, including the recent one with Tim O'Malley, which is shifting from the college environment, which is very contrived. Mm-hmm. You're set up with a bunch of people your age. You probably selected a certain major or college for, you know, similar right. reasons. Right. And once you leave, you're out of that contrived environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you feel yourself a bit unmoored and struggling to relate yeah. in a way. Yeah. There's that question of like, <laughs> will I take up the contrivance for myself yeah. or merely like shake my fist at a world that has left me (laughs) without a meal hall, you know? Yeah. And I think this is from my research. This is what I've come to is you have to, uh, you have to adopt the former or a mental attitude of the former. Totally. um, Totally. Because you have to realize you, you got to put work in and contrive this for yourself. Right. Right. Um, Because a lot of the research shows that people who think, um, who believe that friendship is formed organically uh, tend to be lonelier. And I think, oh really? That's yeah, cool. this was both yeah. referenced in the New York Times and Forbes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be th- this is an amalgamation of a ton of different <laughs> studies, but nice. I'll try to reference them where I can. Um, and I think here the problem is how do you define organically? Because hmm. um, yeah, college is not really they. I think they're addressing organic as college and as the setup of places. Like oh, you just happen to talk to these people, you find people with similar interests. Um, but I th- I think if you understand as we just mentioned that that is a bit contrived and you can contrive that for yourself right right. you'll be set up for a bit more success yeah it would be interesting to think about like when we talk about college being contrived what we really mean is something like your meals are prepared for you uh your housing is is largely taken care of for you right and there comes a time of course in the post-college transition when that's no longer true you have to figure out how to do that stuff for yourself yeah and i think i think in a big in, in large part, what happens is like kind of a time suck somewhere. Like, mm-hmm. all right, well, now that I've got to cook for myself, now that I've got to clean for myself, I don't feel that I can dedicate the same amount of time. Um, but 
yeah, you ask yourself, why am I so lonely? But you're lonely just because like you don't have as much time to dedicate to these kinds of things. And yeah. you have forgotten the degree to which these things were provided. Like yeah. college never was organic. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's a great point. Yeah. Like, it wasn't an organic friendship. Just the contriving was done by some party outside of you. Yeah. And yeah. And college these days is just so much, it's much more ubiquitous. Everybody's going to college. Yeah. So now it feels like the standard experience we've all had and are now leaving mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. have no attachment to anymore. Mm-hmm. But all these articles, essentially, one of the big facts is putting yourself out there. Yeah. Uh, when I came here, I adopted this attitude of say yes to every invitation, yeah. which is not my natural personality. Hmm. Um, even things that I wasn't sure I was going to enjoy. Uh, it was just a matter of showing your face. Yeah. I felt like totally, totally. And when I first got here, you immediately invited me over for a dinner mm-hmm. and I felt, I felt like I was going to be the stranger entering this situation where everybody knows each other, felt a little awkward. But there was the sense of, I have to do this because I have to say yes to everything. Yeah, totally, (laughs) totally. I don't know anybody in this town. Yeah. And it ended up working out pretty well. Nice. I think I got really lucky in that the first people I met in South Bend ended up being pretty close friends. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's the most common experience. Yeah. I think you frequently, you just have to keep showing up in a way. Totally. It's easy to forget. Um, I always try to remember when I'm thinking about hosting or bringing people into a social environment or something like that. Um, it's so, it's so easy to forget. And so I always try to remember what it's like being the new arrival, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the vague sense of terror as you look around a room and feel that you don't like, you know, all these groups are interacting with each other and you don't have an automatic place in. And I think the role of course of a good host is to kind of like plug you in, make you feel at ease. But, uh, yeah, when somebody doesn't do that, the experience of engaging with new people can just feel sort of traumatizing. You can understand precisely why you maybe would not continue to attempt to break into a social circle. Yeah. Because you just feel yeah, yeah, yeah. feel bad. What was the impetus for deciding to start hosting these dinners? Um, well, yeah, it was, it was kind of like a combination of two factors. There was, uh, there was a sense, yeah, uh, in 2012, I guess, I mean, uh, 2011, there was a suicide in my family. Um, and uh, looking at what happened there gave me a sense of, or forced me to realize like, man, uh, this, uh, this uncle of mine, he was really lonely. He didn't have people checking in on him, you know? And um, having had that experience, I began to realize other people, you know, often when you have something like that happen to you, um, people will come to you with their own similar experiences. And I began to, to realize that this feeling I felt in myself, this feeling honestly of quite a bit of loneliness, um, was one that was was shared, right? Uh, so that was factor one. Factor two is uh, a Lana Del Rey song uh, <laughs> where, where she asks the listener to consider whether it is by mistake or design that she feels so alone on a Friday night. Um, and we began to think through this contrivance of like, what if we created a universe where if a person wanted to be alone on a Friday night, it would only ever be by design. Because when it's by mistake, that's sad. But if yeah. you if you choose, yeah. <laughs> then it feels good. But in order to choose to be alone, there has to be a constant outstanding invitation. And we thought, all right, we'll provide that. We'll do a dinner party every Friday night. No RSVP. Anyone can come. Anyone can bring anyone. And then anyone can turn it down and never feel that they're Mm. alone by mistake, which is a sad place. I mean, it's a hard place to be. Versus if you feel, oh, I can't go to this. I, whether you need to be alone or you have another event, you don't feel this sense of dread of, oh, I have nothing going on in my life. And this sense of dread, I mean, this sense of dread is a really interesting thing. Um, The research, it sounds like, you know, the research you've done is on how to make friends, but a lot of the research I just did sort of the passive work that I've done on this has to do with the negative you know, what, what happens when a person is excluded. Um, and that sense of dread is like a totally normal, legitimate human experience because of how we're constituted, right? Like we're not the biggest mammal, the strongest mammal, the fastest mammal. Like we survive through integration in communities. So that feeling we get when we're alone is a feeling of we're, we're, we're sort of hardwired to have, right? Like if I'm not in my pack, I'm not going to get any share of the mammoth meat out here on the Serengeti. Mm. Um, so there's something in us that needs, you know, it's like, friendship's not a luxury. It's like an existential need. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and, and realizing like it's a need everybody has, but that not everybody knows how to get. And so the, so the idea behind the Friday Night Dinner was like, let's offer it. Yeah. Let's create a space where everybody can just count on that being there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, it, you're, you mentioned the, the need or the sen- the, and, you know, that sense of dread, the effects of social exclusion, which I think we often think of as mental um yeah yeah we pathologize but there but there have been recent studies um that and especially this is we've been talking about this at grotto we've talked about this a lot Mm -hmm. um just a very interesting announcement from the surgeon general yeah yeah where he describes an epidemic of loneliness totally this was just last month a couple months ago Mm -hmm. um and this is this is probably the fact that a lot of people were drawing from this study but i think (laughs) it's it's important to point out yeah which is the way, I don't know how they calculate, I don't know their fancy sort yeah. of general math, but they calculated that the effects, the negative effects of loneliness um, health-wise equate to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, if you report being lonely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the report is amazing because I, through my own experience, knew like, well, of course, opioid, or uh, certain diseases or deaths of despair are much higher mm-hmm. because of our social our state of social alienation. Yeah. But to realize like, oh yeah, also you're like way more likely to die of a stroke if you feel lonely. Yeah. Just, you know, you're, you're more liable to have heart disease if you're lonely. I yeah. mean, the statistics are wild. Yeah, and I think there's, it's crazy. Those, because I think we, we, in, we sort of understand the effects. It reminds me of those studies of married men living longer than mm-hmm. unmarried. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that you could probably account for just having someone there if right. you fall down right. to call 911. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's also these increased risks of stroke, higher blood pressure, whatever yeah. things that actually take a toll on you physically yeah. that apparently relate to 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, yeah. Which almost feels like it could be encouraging smoking to a small degree if right. you're making a friend. That's, <laughs> hey, baby. You know what? When I got, when people wagged a little finger at me in grad school, when I had a light cigarette phase, <laughs> I would say like, hey, you know, smoking does kill you. Loneliness kills you faster. Yeah. And now I've got the Surgeon General well, on my say, side. We already have the Surgeon General warning on cigarette packs. Yeah. We need some Surgeon General warning, you know, as soon as you're born. No. Oh, yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Totally. On like uh, lengthy YouTube sessions yeah. late at night. All yeah. of the Surgeon General warnings are starting to conflict a little bit. But no, <laughs> no. <laughs> surgeon I'm General not, warning. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> suggesting. There, Two things can be true at once. Okay. Smoking can be bad for you. And it loneliness can, can be worse be. for you. Right, right, right. <laughs> and I think if you balance it out that you're smoking fewer than 15 a day, but you make a friend, <laughs> you've really balanced out the, <laughs> the negative the effects. That's, that's the Italian <laughs> mode right there. Yeah. Um, I'm getting signals from our producer that I shouldn't, I shouldn't advise smoking. I think we'll just put up the Surgeon General warning on the screen, maybe. <laughs> so it's proven that loneliness is dangerous that we need friends i think this is a huge takeaway like loneliness is dangerous and not just because there's an increased risk of suicide or Mm -hmm. or or these other sorts of like um deaths of despair but it's just across the board not how we were designed to be like we were we were intended for each other which is something you know there's this conversion of like trinitarian theology and evolutionary biology saying like human beings are meant to be together Mm -hmm. like being is communion right and Okay, so we've gotten to a lot of the why. Um, this might get a little repetitive with things I've said, so don't don't worry. I'm not. But well, what would you say? If, let's say you're not ready to host your own dinner party. Okay. Yet. Yeah. What are some ways to? Let's say you move to a new city, uh, you find yourself in a new job, whatever it is, to begin engaging and initiating mm. friendships. <laughs> um, you know what I do? Yeah. Okay. Step one: mindset. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Before anything else. You have to think of the discrete events that you're about to expose yourself to in a very particular way, right? Which is to say, like, in that building, at that party, at that networking event, there is someone who I could love for the rest of my life. You know, there is somebody in there who might go to my wedding and or funeral, right? And just, like, taking for granted that other people have something to offer you and that there's some value in it, right? I mm-hmm. think you, you you do kind of have to psych yourself up before yeah. you engage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But going in with a, that sort of a mindset, and it is true. I mean, if you look back on all your favorite people that you've ever met, uh, often it's, uh, you met them sort of randomly. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. Yeah. I think uh, the second thing is to get really into, or, or, or to begin to when you interact with people at various different kinds of settings, um, become sensitive 
to the ways in which people make offers for friendship, right? This is something that's easily, you know, it goes, I think, maybe like unnoticed or under mm-hmm. noticed. Or uh, I think we subconsciously, I think, pick up on some of these things, but they can be yeah. easy to forget how to respond to a bid for totally, connection totally. or for friendship. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a big fear of rejection. Mm-hmm. And I know there are some studies or theories about how much rejection people can really take. Yeah. We, and it's shockingly small. I mean, I remember reading, um, though it's a, it's a, like a manual on romantic relationships. I remember the Gottman Institute, uh, one of their most famous studies involves bids between romantic partners. And the really like shocking discovery was that once a bid is flatly rejected, like a bid for connection, if it's flatly rejected, a similar bid will never be made ever again. So if I say like, hey, do you want to go to the movies on Friday? And you say, no, no <laughs> then I will not invite you to the movies again. We're not conscious of this, yeah. right? But we just on some level that is almost pre-conscious, hate that feeling of rejection so much that we won't put ourselves back in the same circumstance. So mm-hmm. um, recognizing that when people, you know, when, when there is a gesture made, even even as simple as somebody overhearing something in a conversation and wanting to say like, oh, yeah. hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know King Louis the 14th, you know? <laughs> I saw that TV show. Right, right, yeah. recognize that bid uh, for what it is, which is a attempt at connection and then Run with it. Go with it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, we've also talked about this of, let's say, practically you can't accept that bit of them, like the movies. Yeah, yeah. Turning it into a a sort of, rather than a yes and in the improv sense, a no but. Right, right. I Do you want to come to this thing? Yeah, you know? and, yeah. And even if that doesn't work out, um, having the interaction not feel like a failure. Totally, you know? totally. Like, oh, they couldn't make this, but it's clear they they don't hate me. Right, right. Well, and this <laughs> We're back at ground zero. Totally, uh, yeah. Um, the same studies that show that when we make a bid uh, and if it's flatly rejected, we will never make a, that or a similar bid again, have also shown that if you turn down a bid by by saying like, you know, no, I can't do that, but let me offer you, um, okay, so I can't go to that baseball game mm-hmm. with you, but can you meet me the week after that and we can go to this little outing at the zoo? Even if you can't go to the zoo... Yeah. And and even if I know that you can't go to the zoo, <laughs> um, if I do that, then we're totally fine at read the movie thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a weird sort of effect yeah. where like as long as the the initial bidder doesn't feel rejected, then they will continue to make bids for friendship in the same way. And I, I think there's almost like an iron law encoded somewhere here. Like if you receive an invitation um, for social connection, recognize it for what it is which is a a wager that takes a lot of social confidence which is something i think that we are in like sort of short supply of in Mm -hmm. 2023 yeah um and and handle it handle it gently you know be careful with it yeah (laughs) yeah i think this was um a great thing i I feel like you've mentioned this before and it really has stuck in my mind as to how we do it subconsciously you know we we want someone to i don't want them to feel rejected so i should phrase it in this way yeah yeah kids are very good at this yeah. yeah The rejection thing is interesting. There was a, there were a couple studies that I saw that found um, we go into a lot of these situations with strangers, assuming that we're not well liked. Yeah. Um, and then interesting. And often we tend to be more well liked than we perceive. And mm-hmm. so a, lo- a couple. I think this was a New York Times. Um, they interviewed a psychologist. She just said, "Go in assuming that you're liked. Hmm. More hmm. often than yeah. not, it'll be true." Yeah. Um, well, and that yeah. might help you overcome that fear of rejection. Totally. If, totally. And all, the thing is, is w- looking at a relationship as a failure, whether it, and I've thought about this in romantic context, but I think it applies to platonic context as well, where a lot of these things do take time. You're not going to have this deep connection immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I've heard from other friends is kind of work with the willing, mm-hmm. essentially, yeah. where, you know, maybe you see, oh, I really want to, m- I really want to be friends with someone who... I have all these similarities with, right. I have all these connections with. Yeah, but that might not be who shows up at yeah. the dinner party, yeah. you know? And so finding those little bits in, you know, in small talk, something that's often degraded yeah. <laughs> online. Yeah. I've found people really are, uh, seem to dismiss small talk. Those yeah. are those moments where you can find a little connection. Just put out a little bit, these mini bids almost. Yeah, yeah. Of, well, what about this? And they're like, oh, I don't watch that show. Yeah. Uh, what about this? Oh, I'm from that town. You right, know, right, and like right. maybe just trying to find any purchase mm-hmm. that you can really move forward with a relationship. 
Um, have you made any really strange bids for friendship or things that maybe you didn't think were going to work out or you knew were odd? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know that I do it any other way. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think being really, really, uh, to think of a particular example, I remember one time going to the Coptic Festival <laughs> um, in Minneapolis and St. Paul and thinking, I would really love, I would really, really love to be able to um, make a friend here because I want to see what a Coptic liturgy is like. And that, and, and, and going into this festival thinking, I'm going to make a friend here. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to make a friend here. <laughs> That's that attitude again. <laughs> no, and it is. I mean, it, it sounds silly when you, when, when, you, yeah. when you say it out loud, it makes it sound like uh, you're some sort of like, I don't know, uh, narcissist. Yeah. But, but to walk into a setting and just say like, I'm going to make a friend here, mm-hmm. it, it, it changes the way the landscape looks because rather than looking at potentially threatening strangers, you see potential loci of connection. Potential funeral attendees. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I have, a, yeah, I have a vivid memory of being like, all right, let's get in the tour group with the dude that looks like he's about my age. Nice. Let's joke. Okay. Hey, you want to come to a dinner? We're doing it on Friday. Yeah. And I think being pretty bold, like yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of coming up with the, uh, like, the date and the time early on um but yeah mike massad that's how i became friends with mike massad uh, mm-hmm. and we were good pals through shout all. out to mike massad really. shout out to mike massad <laughs> yeah yeah well i think the date and time thing is important i actually saw a few of these that were really addressing the adult side of making friends yeah in the sense that um our lives are often are often dictated and pr- we prioritize certain things whether it's a nine to five mm-hmm. or and everyone's busy and everyone has different schedules and as you mentioned you really have to take this upon yourself and so I think setting dates and times, making mm-hmm. things explicit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've found at least has helped with totally. committing. Because totally. it, it's like a that attitude of saying yes to every invite, but a bit preemptive where I have to, even you know, I have to actively schedule these things yeah. that I'm honestly a little unsure about totally. to a certain extent. Well, <laughs> this is part of what made the Friday night dinner so successful was that we would, we all just agreed with each other. We're going to, it's going to be 630 every Friday night at you know my house and be and come to find out like uh that's how you make friends you you make friends through regular repeated exposure at roughly the same time mm-hmm. um on a regular basis right uh like n- w- there have been very very cool studies done on newscasters and the, the sort of parasocial role that newscasters will play in people's lives mm-hmm. people feel that they are friends because every night at seven o'clock they see that same face appear before them, right? Yeah. And so we are so wired for friendship that we will turn the newscaster into what is what is registered by our body as a friend. Like our yeah. cortisol levels will fall. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. if we miss it, we feel stressed and concerned because they're actually functioning in the office of friend, hmm. right? Like back back with great great grandpa on the Serengeti. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we maybe did see the same people every night at seven, right? Yeah. And what I found is that my most enduring friendships are ones that are a result of that same kind mm. of dynamic where you can say like, hey, every Thursday morning I get breakfast with with a friend, right? Yeah. And that's a very feels like a very solid friendship. Mm-hmm. We lift weights every morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and again, that repeated exposure at roughly yeah. the same time creates a, a a very very deep sense of like belonging and rhythm and yeah. ritual um, and embeddedness, which creates I think a lot of the confidence that yeah you know, yeah it, it, yeah it feeds back into itself because once you have that confidence, then you can continue to make friends because you feel yeah. that you are you know. What's very cool is that this what you've just mentioned seems to from um, from some of the research I've done apply to strangers as well mm-hmm. um and it looks like the new york Times refers to this as the quote mere exposure effect mm. um and this is and npr in a separate article suggests getting into a routine as a way yeah, of totally. a consistent routine and what this does is it puts you in the same place around the same strangers yeah. who also are in that routine yeah and that gives you a very loose tie to that person right right um, that can often that can then be a launching off point at another social thing or a reason to essentially talk to this person. Mm-hmm. And apparently, according to the mere exposure effect, merely being exposed to yeah. someone frequently gives you at a certain time gives you this tie that maybe you initiate a conversation then like, oh, I see you here every morning. What you know, whether it's like 
you can make a comment now. Yeah. On, oh, I haven't seen you around lately. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. if you see them at a different event, like, hey, you're at the gym at this time every morning. <laughs> yeah. You don't or, belong yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get really angry about it. <laughs> Tell them to get back to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but there's this effect of, um, I think NPR referred to it as finding a third person. Uh, initiating a third place that's hmm. not work mm-hmm. or home and they kind of reference a bar scene where the bartender knows what drink you always yeah. get or a coffee order that you yeah, always get totally and how that can create you know in the cheers sense a place where everybody knows your name totally and also yeah. ted danson is there yeah maybe ideally <laughs> yeah but there is this thing where um I, you know i've had this happen at coffee shops where someone knows your order yeah. and that even if it doesn't turn into anything immediately yeah that's all really we need as humans there's something mentally yeah that there's can something really that 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 experience provides you. Yeah. Uh, and I think what it provides you is a sense of embeddedness, which it translates into confidence. So in particular, social confidence mm-hmm. that you can then sort of leverage to make more friends. Like yeah. my, a really good pal along in 2017 was like, hey, let's get a breakfast every Thursday morning, you know? And of course that primary friendship was strengthened and, it, and one could begin to feel this sense of a deepening relationship be- that that's, comes out of that kind of trust of mm-hmm. promises kept. But on another level, all those faces of all those other people began to work to help cement my role in the community. Yeah. And I've seen this happen you know, over and over and over again, where um, if you make yourself present in a sort of, in a consistent way, uh, the rewards of that socially are huge. And you can translate those rewards into other, into other areas. So it's almost like, hey, you just moved to a new city, mm-hmm. find somebody you think is cool, and pick a time and a date and hang out with them consistently then, you know, yeah. like go get breakfast. Um, the, the most uncomplicated meal of the day. That, there's another, <laughs> there's another big tip. That's the hack, breakfast. Yeah. Early breakfast at a cheap diner. It's an uncomplicated meal. Lunch is complicated. You can't get emotionally involved during lunch. <laughs> um, dinner's complicated, rife with, you know. I feel like there's a lot more, um, that's, uh, dinner feels more weighted. You know, it's, it's a lot more it's very weighted. It. Yeah. It's very, it could be good. Dates are often dinners. Right. You know, right, there's just a right. lot. Take you to dinner. That's yeah. not a uncharged statement. Yeah. You know? Um, so I like this. Breakfast. Yeah, that would say that's my big hack is like find some people. Well, what you ought to do, yeah, this would be my plan. Go mm-hmm. to a party. As an icebreaker at that party, ask every single person how they know the host. Mm. Then use how they know the host as your map of like where social connections are happening, right? Okay. Um, yeah, if you seem to be getting one answer consistently. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there's individualized answers to these people that you find in common. Right, I yeah. I like breakfast. Totally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, do you like breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> do you wanna, yeah. Um, and then yeah, once once you've sort of established a relationship with a few people, pick who, who you think like, yeah, I think we could be really good friends and say like, hey, why don't we, why don't we set up a standing mm-hmm. <laughs> date, you know? Um, a lot of the most socially intelligent people I know do this. I, 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 uh, they, they're masters, I think, of, of ritual. And I, finding, identifying certain, you know, right after lunch, we're always going to have this 10-minute conversation. Or every Monday night, we're going to get a drink. Or every Thursday, we're going to get breakfast. Mm-hmm. Every Friday night, we're going to have a large and potentially raucous dinner party, you know. I, and I think that giving people the sense of embeddedness is a really, really, really important part of building a... a yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to say improving the social capital of a, <laughs> of a given community, but then realized that, yeah, I like to introduce myself as a social venture yeah. capitalist, <laughs> you know, but it's sort of a weighted. So if this, like hearing that, yeah. going to a party, going up to everybody, asking a certain question, it still for me seems um, loaded with a lot of awkwardness yeah. for at least my personality. Yeah. Um, yeah. I tend to be a bit more introverted. Do you have any advice for overcoming awkwardness is can you not even be overcome is there a certain embracing that you have Hmm. to do for awkwardness that you just can't escape i still yeah you know what honestly uh i still feel just as awkward as i've ever felt like um week one i think i think it's it's a matter of just overcoming like i i think it's a matter of just saying well yeah here's the best way of conceptualizing it i think um recognize that if you fail it'll be a funny story that you can have later and literally at, at, at the same party right hmm. if you <laughs> if you make an attempt and you biff it or you know you make some yeah. bad joke or something yeah. doesn't work just file that bad boy away uh <laughs> re-narrativize it go to the next person be like wow i i cannot believe i just <laughs> you know yeah 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 i didn't know i didn't know his mom sells salmon i would never yeah you know. um 
but I think, yeah, I, I, the, the biggest thing here, I think, is like, is that mindset thing. Yeah. Having that vision of like, hey, these people <laughs> could be my funeral. Yeah. I'm going to be committed to like finding someone. Yeah. Um, or even another thing that is when I feel nervous about being in new spaces, I sometimes kind of change that funeral thing, which yeah. can be bleak, uh, <laughs> to like assume that somebody at this gathering knows something that if you knew would make your life a lot easier. Hmm. And, and that's kind of cool because then you can walk in with a little bit more with, with, with your mind on the subject of like, what are the things that are tricky in my life? Which is then a way to kind of be, it encourages you to be a little bit vulnerable with people, yeah. right? You can yeah. say like, oh, I've been having a really hard time, um, you know, finding a, 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 well, I've been having a hard time being consistent with my gym schedule. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Or even if it's not, yeah, if it's more practical of like, oh, this thing in my house is broken. Yeah, or this. yeah, exactly, and, exactly. And I feel we've, uh, this is an interesting thing that I didn't know, um, this effect of when you do a favor for someone else or when someone does something for you, how they become actually more endeared towards you. Yeah, I think yeah. I at least still, and I still approach things this way, feel fear I'm being a burden Yeah, that someone is going out of their way, that they don't want to do this. But there are some studies, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how much this is proven that show that can actually endear you to people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we tend to have like a social picture that looks like a bank account. And if I ask you for something, then I have depleted like, 19 points in my mm-hmm. sort of you know jane ledger um but it was it's very famously i think yeah uh ben franklin who when he would move to a new place asked people to perform favors for him and found that people who had done favors for him liked him more on the other side of having done those favors because the brain it seems and like studies that have followed this up yeah um like the, the, the hypothesis that seems to be the working one with this particular phenomenon is that we our brains don't like cognitive dissonance. So if we dislike somebody, mm. we're not going to do something for them. But that yeah. works in reverse, where like if we've done something for them, our brain will be like, because yeah. we like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I, yeah, actually, yeah, I think it's um, the Ben Franklin thing isn't, I remember it now being called the Benjamin Franklin effect. The Benjamin Franklin effect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, what was the, the story was, I think there was this person in the legislature or politically that he didn't like too much who had just come out with a book. And so he asked him, hey, can I, I'd like to read your book. Can you lend it to me? Yeah. He immediately lent it to him. I need a copy of that <laughs> rare book that only you yeah. have. Could you, at your yeah, expense, yeah, yeah. please bring that book to me. Yeah. 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 And then he immediately sent it. He read it. They chatted about it and they became a friend until the other guy's death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, funeral. Yeah. And then he went to his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can really skip that step. Just go to a party, start handing out invites to your own <laughs> funeral. <laughs> but I think that's something that for me, it's still, even I've now known about this for a few months but it, mentally it's very hard to accept i still have this feeling of yeah uh people don't want to do things for you people think less of you actually when they have to do things for you mm-hmm. um i i come off as this person who's always needing this help but i think then i think even that can become a a, a mo a, a opportunity for exchange almost yeah of your yeah. own services right not saying right. you have to have certain skills but right um yeah, I found this can operate. People t- tend to be interested in the things you do and what you can do for them. Mm-hmm. Not that it's, you know, utilitarian this way, but um, there can be a mode for for relationship. Totally. There. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I think it requires reconceptualizing what, you know, we, we have sort of a built in um, notion of how friendship works as like a give and take. And not that it isn't that, but but the logic of that particular market is not the logic of you know, mm-hmm. the market, Qua, uh, Kroger, and Best Buy, right? Yeah. It's a very different economy where actually people like to be offered the chance to help, yeah. right? So let's say you've evolved past some of the finding some initial friendships here, and you do actually want to host your own party. I yeah. mean, this is not the, necessarily the topic of the episode, but do you have any advice, tips for hosting, facilitating? Oh, yeah. oh. Absolutely. Conversation. Here, yeah, th- I've got a golden tip. Okay, <laughs> this, yeah, wow, to be able to to deliver <laughs> this to the to the public. Um, yeah, the most important thing if you're hosting is to remember when a person walks in. Remember how awkward you feel when you've walked into a space that you haven't been in before, and how do you alleviate the awkwardness? This is the tip: put a drink into the hand of the person who's entered immediately. And I'm not saying alcoholic. I'm saying a bottled water. A sparkling water 
give them a sense of option. Like, but immediately give that person something to do with their hands. I don't know what it is, but yeah. this has been tried yeah. through a decade of experience. When the new arrivee has something to hold and something to do, then they're not like floating through that space in a voidless way. Right. They can at least ostensibly be sipping on that water bottle while yeah. staring into the middle distance yeah. as opposed to just staring into the middle distance, which is a ontologically different yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> so offering offering a drink. I mean, mm. this is we're really getting to the nitty gritty, but offering something, putting something in the hand. Yeah. Um, and then just as a bonus, you know. The drink in the hand, I know you just do that if you. That's that's yeah, yeah, yeah. junior well, varsity, but then do an introduction as the host. Mm, Give that person a natural place to belong. Yeah, you know. Um, I think that that's that does hold true for events I'm at. I think there's a sense the biggest fear is looking like you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, where yeah. you are, and you and know if you how at to least drink. I was to say if you at least know how to <laughs> sip a drink, <laughs> then you'll like, be all right. Yeah, that guy knows he's sipping a drink right yeah, now. Yeah. he's cool. Well, <laughs> and the other yeah, I, I think the third thing too is um, people get really stressed in those environments, like in an environment where there's the potential for their own rejection. Um, and touch is like a natural way of making people feel that they're very embedded. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes to a Friday night dinner at my house, I always try to give them a big hug. Um, if that, you know, if you, I feel like that's okay for them, yeah. give them a drink and say like, Oh, you know, if, if there's somebody who doesn't yeah, yeah, know yeah. other people there very well, make that introduction. But I would say like the drink, primary importance, mm -hmm. shunting them off appropriately, yeah. secondary. And you know, why not do it? You know, the two-handed hand clasp, <laughs> right? Um, just, just a little, a little yeah. something, a little flesh touch and flesh, baby. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, this also, I feel like, does a thing where you often feel you're being really awkward and don't know how to engage or be confident in certain engagements. Mm -hmm. And if someone else is doing that, yeah. someone else is going overboard yes. almost. Yes. To an yes. Yes. You feel like you're not the weirdo right, anymore. Right. Right. And even if you, as the going overboard host, are in fact a weirdo then at least you can become <laughs> the topic of conversation in the subsequent conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right? Like, like, wow, wasn't that guy really weird? Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why did he... Why did he double hand clasp? <laughs> a double <us>? hand clasp? <laughs> yeah, I don't even like water. This sort of goes back to the failure thing of who knows what friendships are going to be deepened. Um, and we, we'll, we'll wrap this up. I think we've covered a lot of ground as nice. far as making friends. Do you have a way of... Um, not necessarily discerning who's going to be a close friend, who's not. I think that happens very naturally. But ways to deepen friendships, maybe, in as part of this contriving your own yeah environment for community and for friendship. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. One of the most important things I think is is focusing on. Uh, it's okay. At the very beginning of this episode, you, we we talked a little bit about the idea of contrivance, and there can be an allergy to contrivance. Uh, and I think that that's misplaced, you know, I think it's okay to like, actually certain forms of contrivance are really good. Um, so there's certain things like, um, whenever we've got a birthday party, I'll do it. There's a thing that I'll, I've done with friends for a long time, which is ask a series of, of questions on the birthday, uh, talking about, you know, Hey, you're turning this year. What was your favorite thing about last year? Um, what's one thing you learned last year? How'd you learn that thing? What do you want to do next year? What's your goal for next year? And like, it's a pretty contrived set of five questions. Mm -hmm. But I find that like having ready to hand a sort of conversational, uh, 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 the ability to have kind of like a reflective moment with somebody that you have planned out already, it works. It yeah. plays, you know? Like, yeah. And people are, people are grateful for the chance. Like those kinds of contrivances, uh, conversation games even, mm -hmm. um, they, they're not, they, they provide the ground for something deeper to happen, right? I think that they should not be dismissed out of hand as uh, fake, but rather seen as like platforms where something deeper can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Sort of in the same way that small talk is not fake. Yeah. It's like, yeah. A, it's, it is this launching off point. Um, yeah, I think the like, avoiding contrivance or avoiding the fear of contrivance yeah. is, is pretty important. I think even for a lot of these, one of the most basic tips if you do any research on how to make friends in a new community is find interest groups. Mm -hmm. You like to rock climb? Join the rock climbing club. Yeah. Join the book club. Do yeah. these things. And there is this fear that these settings feel like what's really drawing us together. We right. have to create this environment. Um, and I think that's just, it's such a, I guess just don't, don't worry too much about it being so organic. Right, right. Um, obviously, I'm just speaking only a year out of college. So who <laughs> knows? Maybe this will all fall apart. Yeah. But, but it bears <laughs> with my experience, you yeah. know? 
Um, and the research. And, this, and it, this research. It's all right there, baby. Yeah. <laughs> this all so far, you know, holds true to my experience. Um, yeah, and I think there's always i think it's always a learning thing everybody seeks relationships yeah, yeah. everybody seeks friendships and don't take that for granted totally, that you're the only totally. one out there who's looking for friends right, who's feeling right. awkward um who doesn't know what they're doing with their hands right right i feel this all the time you know that when somebody else reaches out and wants to make a connection with me i almost never interpret it as that person is a weirdo i almost always just even if they even if it is weird or mm -hmm. awkward i'm always heartened by it you know and realizing hey, you can actually offer the, another person the chance to be heartened by your perhaps heavy-handed or insufficiently coherent um, bid for relationship. Like, go ahead and take that risk. Like, take that wager. Yeah. It's hard to take the wager because I think we feel that our social resources are very limited. Yeah. Because they are. I mean, we live in a pretty atomized time. But um, it costs you nothing. You can keep making that wager all day long. You yeah. know, you only build that pool up and you get a little embarrassed, whatever. Tell your other friends about that <laughs> embarrassing thing you just did, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I insulted salmon in yeah, front of this guy. Exactly. <laughs> you have to biff it before you learn it is an ironclad rule. So yeah. like biff making new friends a lot. And before long, you have a lot of friends to talk about how you like uh, tripped up. Yeah. Et cetera. Well, I think that's a, a great way to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Evan. My for pleasure. sharing your wisdom uh, on yep. friends, hosting <laughs> dinners, facilitating. Put that drink, in, put drinks in those hands, baby. Yeah, <laughs> just that's all I ask. A drink in a hand. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. This has been "Don't Say Adulting" with Jane O'Connor, sometimes Mike Rossetti, <laughs> 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 and um, we'll see you guys next time. Don't Say Adulting is a Grotter Network podcast produced by Jane O'Connor, Mike Rossetti, Kevin DeClute, and Josh Long. Additional production and editing done by Kevin DeClute. Graphics and animation by Becky Rogers. Grotter Network is director Javi Zubi Zaretta, senior producer Josh Long, senior content editor Jesse McCartney, art director Becky Rogers, senior manager for community engagement Mike Rossetti, social media manager Adrian Garaldi, web content strategist Michaela Douglas, producer Kevin DeClute, associate producer Jane O'Connor. Special thanks to our guest and Notre Dame Studios.